Hello, family. My name is Dewan. Welcome to those of you on the YouTube chat and on Discord. Thank you so much for accepting God's invitation for us to come together and worship together today. So isn't this what we've been talking about over the past few weeks? How we can come together as community just to worship and learn more about Jesus and what it means to be a Jesus follower, a disciple of Jesus. We see in our campfire series, you can come together informally around a campfire. We have our Sunday morning gatherings. We talked about home church and getting together midweek as a group. Um, but another thing that we offer here um, at the, the Meeting House are the TMHU courses. So our TMHU, TMHU courses are just courses talking about the Bible and about Jesus and various topics regarding our faith as it, rela as it relates to social and different cultural issues. Um, so for those of you like myself who may like to learn in more of a classroom setting, this is also an opportunity or an option for you. Let's take a look at this video so we can hear more about it. Hey everyone, I'm Dan, and today I'm here with Wynne Furr. She's one of the KidMax coordinators at the Perry Sound site. Now, Winfrey, you recently took one of the TMHU courses, uh, Pop Culture 101. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, um, I took the course. Um, I saw it was really interesting when that came up because pop culture, uh, our, I have two kids who are in their early 20s and I wanted to be able to engage with their conversations and well, be a cool mom, right? So, and I also enjoy movies and TV shows and music. And I love that we can try to find God in those things. That's awesome. Did the course offer the experience you were looking for? Yeah, it was wonderful. Um, I learned to discern what is good and what is not good in social media, um, to look at different films and TV shows and, and music to, f to take what is healthy, to look at it in a healthy way. Um, I also learned how to be intentional about how to use my devices. Um, you know, I'm old, so I didn't even know that I could turn off the notifications for my Facebook. So it was just... Uh, um, mind-boggling to think I can actually not look at my phone and not be disturbed by notifications. So that was great. Um, the course also gave me guidelines to look at different mediums and find ways to connect with my faith. Um, it introduced me to several shows and songs and music that I even thought of looking at, but it gave me ideas for good discussion points that can be used to connect with other people about God. So it was great. That's awesome. I, having just recently discovered how to turn off notifications myself, can attest to how amazing that is. Um, if people are on the fence about these TMHU courses, what would you recommend that they do? Um, I would say just look for a w one that you'd be interested in, try it out. I found, because I also lead a home church and I'm a Kidmax, um, one of the Kidmax coordinators, um, it was wonderful just to um, sit at a course on something that I didn't have to organize, I didn't have to prepare for, and just attend and be blessed and learn. So that was one of the wonderful things about the course. And being online too, I could do a student anywhere in my home and you know, I, it doesn't matter where I am, it was wonderful. Thanks again for sharing, Winfer. If anyone is interested in taking these TMHU courses, you can find them at themeetinghouse.com. Talk to your home church elder, talk to your local pastor about some of the subjects that might interest you. And please take advantage of these resources that are there. Thanks again, Winfer, and we'll see you all next time. So yes, doesn't that sound cool? Some of the courses that we offered were Bible 101, Jesus 101, The Disciple Maker. There was a lot of courses that we offered through the TMHU. And you know what? It wouldn't be possible for the development and delivery of these courses without your faithful giving and generosity. So we wanna thank you so much, family, for, for continuing to give. And um, we also want to encourage you to look forward, stay tuned for more of these courses um, and keep your ears open for what's gonna be offered, okay? So once again, like I said, thank you so much for your generosity and your faithful giving that helps us to offer these courses. And also, I also want to say, if you'd like to support or give a one-time um, gift towards us, feel free to visit themeetinghouse.com slash give. Okay, so now it's time for us to go into a, a time of musical worship and also for teaching. Today, we're going to be hearing from Eric Versluce. And Eric is our Ottawa lead pastor. 
He was also one of the instructors for Pop Culture 101. So I'm really excited to hear from him this morning. So before we step into a time of musical worship, let's just pray together. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity for us to come together and worship you. I pray right now that your Holy Spirit will just calm our hearts and our minds and prepare us for that which you have for us today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Welcome, happy long weekend. We're going to engage in some musical worship right now if you wanna stand and join us.
So I don't know about you, but I have a tendency to punish myself when I feel like I've missed the mark or done something wrong. And I like to take myself out of God's presence because I feel so unworthy and I'm so aware that I don't deserve his grace and his love. And sometimes I just feel so broken. But then I remember the longer that I'm focusing on myself and how bad I feel I've been, it's, it's a longer amount of time that I'm not actually letting God use me or, or renew me or restore me and I'm not really serving him. And it's in that brokenness that we learn to trust him and depend on him. And it can be a long and hard process, but that's where God does his best work. And so instead of punishing ourselves, just remembering that there's nothing we can do to ever, ever be outside of God's love gives me so much hope and reassurance whatever God's going to do as long as I'm open and saying, here I am, this is what I've done, but I trust you to redeem this. And it's when we are weak that he is strong. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 to 10 says, he said to me, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults and hardships, persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Will your grace run out if I
Rise and grind. The internet. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build cities of Pithom and Ramses as supply centers for the king. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, and the more alarmed the Egyptians became. Exodus chapter 1, verses 11 to 12. I spent my whole life trying to make it, trying to chase it. Kendrick Lamar. So the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter, forcing them to mix mortar and to make bricks and do all the work in the fields. They were ruthless in all their demands. Exodus chapter one, verses 13 and 14. Adulthood is saying, but after this week, things will slow down a bit, over and over until you die. That meme on Facebook. The Israelites continued to groan under the burden of their slavery. They cried out for help and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. Exodus chapter 2 verses 23 to 25. No days off. Every Instagram influencer. <laughs> Welcome everybody. We're here at the meeting house on our final Sunday for the series of Moses, Jesus, and the space in between. And this is something that we do here at the Meeting House. Every summer, we usually take a deep dive into a, a passage of Old Testament scripture. This year, we're looking at the life of Moses. We've had an opportunity to hear from a number of our other pastors that are at different, uh, different uh, communities within the, our, our church. And it's been such an amazing gift to be able to hear from uh, Jeremy on our week one, Chris Chase, uh, Jimmy and Carmen, who we know and we, we love, right? But but this morning, I'm really uh, I'm thrilled to have our dear friend uh, Eric join us. He's the pastor from our Ottawa community, and um, we get an opportunity to experience what people in Ottawa know, people who get to work with Eric know, is that he's an amazing guy and is filled with insight. So I'm just happy to, can we welcome him? Like give her a proper welcome. I'm so happy. Really happy that you're here with us this morning um, and excited to hear what you got to share with us. So I'm excited to be here too, Quincy, and excited to be with all of you. No days off. 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 This is the mantra of our hustle and grind culture that tells us that no days off is the way to get what it is that we think we need and to become who we want to be. No days off. No days off. This is the mantra that we tell ourselves that it's the way that we get what it is that we long for to achieve our goals. And we feel like if we stop for even a moment, for even a day, we're going to fall behind. No days off. No days off. Now, I don't mean to brag, but at the beginning of July, I did take a bunch of days off. Like three weeks worth, in fact. It was the first time I've ever taken three consecutive weeks of vacation. And that felt like a big deal, so I made sure to, to clear it with my Ottawa community and talk to the people here at the meeting house and said, you know, is it okay if I take three weeks? And they're like, Eric, it would be so great for you to take that time off and to rest and to take three weeks of vacation. Like, just, it'll be so good for you. And I knew it was a long time to be off, so I, I, I worked extra hard to make sure that everything was taken care of while I was on vacation. 
And so I, 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 I organized everything, made sure all my responsibilities were covered, and it, it was good. So I had permission, I was organized, I've never been so prepared to go on vacation in my life. And I got to the very first day of my time off, and it was probably about 10.30, 11 o'clock on a Monday morning. And normally my Mondays are filled with checking emails and a meeting or two, and I got to to mid-morning, and I had not a sweet clue what to do with myself. I was so antsy. I was like, I should be doing something, anything. I was like, you know, dusting the the cupboards already, because I was just like, I need to be doing something to feel productive. I need to be working. And so I I, I was like, this isn't going to work. I can't do this for three weeks. This is going to be terrible. And so I, I took my dog out for a walk, and there's a trail near my house, and I just went out, and I took some deep breaths, and I meditated and prayed a little bit and just tried to figure out why I felt so anxious at the prospect of taking three weeks off when I had permission and when I had everything organized and taken care of. Nobody was going to, nothing was going to fall apart without me. And I realized that was actually a little bit of, of the fear, was that like actually nothing was going to fall apart without me. Nobody was going to need me. I, I, I wasn't going to Nobody was going to miss me. I, I wasn't going to produce anything, so I wasn't going to have any value. And, and I realized that too much of my identity is tied into the work that I do and how people perceive it. And that I was, my, my ego was actually going to miss out on that hit of like, oh, I did something, I've achieved something, now I'm worth something. And so I actually had to sit down on a bench on this trail and I had to write out a permission note to myself to say, Eric, it's okay for you to take three weeks off. Your value is not found in what you do, in what you produce, or in how people receive it. Your value, your value it goes way beyond that, and so it's okay to rest. It's okay to not do anything. No days off. No days off. Now, statistics tell us that no days off is not just a mantra, but it's actually the reality for many people. Recent studies show that about 40% of households right now, at least one person in the household is working a side hustle to make some extra money on top of their full-time job. Study that came out um, just recently in July says that right now, more people are working the equivalent of two full-time jobs than at any point since they began tracking the data in 1994. Those numbers don't count for the, the people who are putting in overtime. Those of us who work from home and are putting in unpaid hours where we're checking emails at all hours of the day and responding to, to the requests for our time and attention doesn't account for the people who are doing um, school on top of work, or of course those who are parents on top of their work and all the other responsibilities we might have. No days off. No days off. And the result of this no days off experience that we have of working all the time is that so many of us just feel perpetually behind, inadequate, and exhausted. Lynn Twist puts it this way. She says, For me and for many of us, our first waking thought of the day is, I didn't get enough sleep. The next one is, I don't have enough time. Whether true or not, that thought of not enough occurs to us automatically before we even think to question or examine it. We spend most of the hours and the days of our lives hearing explaining, complaining, or worrying about what we don't have enough of. Before we even sit up in bed, before our feet touch the floor, we're already inadequate, already behind, already losing, already lacking something. And by the time we go to bed at night, our minds are racing with a litany of what we didn't get or didn't get done that day. We go to sleep burdened by those thoughts and wake up to that reverie of lack. How many of us are familiar with that reverie of lack? 
that sense of being behind, not having enough. For many of us, that reverie of lack is the soundtrack of our lives. And psychologist Richard Beck tells us that that reverie of lack, that fear of, not, of being behind, is motivated by two fundamental fears. One is the fear of not having enough, and one is the fear of not being enough. The fear of not having enough, and the fear of not being enough. Now, the fear of not having enough is basic sort of survival fear. It's, it's will I have enough money to, to, to care for my family? Will I have food? Will I have shelter? Will I have clothing? Will I have basic things? Will my health maintain? And in a world where inflation has far outpaced the increase in wages and everything seems more expensive and a dollar doesn't go nearly as far as it used to, this anxiety, this fear of not having enough is very real. And in fact, for many of us, no days off is simply the thing that we have to do in order to survive, in order to pay the bills, in order to make the math math. But even if we did have enough, even if that, we didn't have to worry about any of those things, Richard Beck says that we would still be motivated by fear. The fear of not being enough. And the fear of not being enough is, do I matter? Do I have value? What is my legacy? Will I make a difference? Am I enough? Brene Brown says it's the shame-based fear of being ordinary. That we, it's this desire to be seen as extraordinary, to be noticed, to matter. And so in this light, no day is off is simply what it takes to be great, to be extraordinary, to matter. And it's interesting, both this fear of not having enough and not being enough is not so much something that comes to us from the outside, but it comes from within ourselves. If your boss came to you and said, you know what, our new company policy is no days off, you'd be like, my dude, I think I'm going to find another job. And yet, we'll take no days off and we'll screen grab it and put it as the lock screen on our phone so that we're like, yeah, that's motivating me to get up on my Saturday long weekend morning to do something that matters. The call is coming from inside the house. It's our own reverie of lack. We are slaves to our own fears. So Pharaoh said to his people, Look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them growing, from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Exodus 1, 9-10. Now what is motivating Pharaoh here in his decision to oppress the Israelites? Fear. There's a fear of not having enough. He's, he's afraid for his survival. He's afraid that the Israelites are going to get too strong, too powerful, and they're going to overthrow the empire, and they're going to take all the money, they're going to take all the power, and they're probably going to kill him. So he's motivated by fear of not having enough. He's also motivated by the fear of not being enough. He has a legacy to protect. He doesn't want to be the pharaoh who was in charge when there was a slave revolt and they overthrew the empire. They don't build pyramids for the guy who oversaw the end of the Egyptian empire. He has a legacy to protect. So he's afraid of not being enough. And so he, he comes up with this plan that, well, we're just going to make them work more. We're going to enslave them and oppress them and make them work. Because if they have to work <clears throat> to have enough, then they're going to be so busy on that that they, that they won't be able to, to, to rally and overthrow the empire. And so he just says, no days off, no days off, and puts the Israelites to work. And the result is, is that the Israelites have to just work day after day after day in order to have enough to survive. And their entire identity, their enti entire sense of being enough doesn't exist because all they are are slaves. 
That's their only identity. Is their only value comes from the work that they do and what they produce. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so they find themselves trapped in this cycle of no days off. It's a, a literal type of hell. And there seems to be no escape. And so in Exodus 2, it says, The Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help, and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel, and he knew it was time to act. Jimmy talked about this last week, how God is a God who rescues God, the Israelites are crying out in their oppression of no days off, in their slavery, and God hears their cry, and he knows it is time to act. And so he recruits Moses, and he partners with Moses to help set the people free. And through Moses, God makes two promises to the Israelites. And what I love about these promises is not only are they promises to set them free from their slavery in Egypt, but they are also promises that meet the needs of the fears that drive all of us. The fears of not having enough and not being enough. So through Moses, God promises the Israelites new land. He says he's going to take them into the promised land. He says in Exodus 3, 8, I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So this land that God promises the Israelites is a land of enough. There's enough space for everybody there's enough for everyone to eat. There's enough resources for everyone to have what they need. There is milk and honey flowing. This is a land of enough. This land will meet their need of not having enough. And God also promises not just a new land, but a new identity. In Exodus 6, 7, he says, I will claim you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. I will claim you as my own people. God promises to give them a new identity. Up until this point, their identity was as slaves. Their identity was only based on the work that they did and what they were able to produce. But God says, I will make you my people. You don't have to work for this. You don't have to earn it. This is just a gift that I give to you. This is, this is who you are. You don't have to work for it. So new land, new identity. A place where there is enough, an identity that you are enough. And God keeps his promises. And if we read on in the story, we know that God liberates them from Egypt and moves them into, eventually, into the new land where they learn to live in their new identity as God's people. And so what Moses did for the Israelites, Jesus wants to do for all of humanity. He wants to liberate us from the things that keep us captive. He wants to set us free from fear. Jesus starts his ministry, the very first sermon he gives, he says this. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, and that the oppressed will be set free. Because God is always a God who rescues. God always is working to set people free. And just like Moses, Jesus promises to set us free from the fears that drive us. Jesus also promises us a new land and a new identity, just like Moses where Moses promised a new land called the promised land, Jesus talked often about the kingdom of God. He said the kingdom of God is at hand, which means it's nearby, it's available. You can enter into the kingdom of God. And in this kingdom of God, Jesus says that you don't have to worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. He says you don't have to worry about having enough. Because the primary 
guiding principle of this kingdom of Jesus is to love your neighbor as yourself. And when you love your neighbor as yourself, you're going to make sure that your neighbor has what they need. And your neighbor is going to make sure that you have what you need. And together, you're going to make sure that everyone in the community has enough. Everybody has what they need. So So Jesus promises us a new land. He also promises us a new identity. Moses said, well, you'll be the people of God. Jesus says, he says, I'll, I'll call you friends. But he also says you are the children of God, which I think is a beautiful identity because it's not an identity that we have to work for in any way. It just is inherent in who we are. Your kids, your, your son, your daughter will always be your son and daughter. And they didn't have to do anything to earn that. They just were born. And they're your son or your daughter. They're your child. And that's how Jesus says that we are, is that we are just the children of God. We don't have to work for it. Our value is not found in what we produce. It is just in our identity as children of God, created in his image. He speaks to the fears that drive us and meets that need and says, in my kingdom, if you follow me, you will have enough and you will know that you are enough. Now, this is a lot for us to get our mind around. So Jesus gives us a metaphor. He says, you guys should be like branches on a vine. What does he mean by that? Well, in John 15, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, what allows a branch to bear fruit is not the work that it does, but what it's rooted in. That it's rooted in the tree. It's rooted in the vine. And when it's rooted in the vine, then it bears fruit. And the bearing fruit is the having enough, the being enough. It's doing what it's supposed to do. It it creates abundance by remaining in the vine. Now, what does it mean to remain in Jesus? We often think about remaining as something passive. But to remain in Jesus is actually an invitation to an act of resistance. To remain in Jesus is to resist the lie that our value is tied to what we do or what we produce. To remain in Jesus is to resist the hustle and grind of our culture, and instead practice rhythms of rest and stillness and quiet. To remain in Jesus is to resist the scarcity mindset that we have to hold on to what we've got. It doesn't make a difference if we make it or not. But, sorry. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Somebody got it. I appreciate that. All right. Um, It doesn't matter that we need to hold on to what we have, but we can actually hold it loosely and share it with others. To remain is to trust Jesus when he says that you will have enough and that you are enough. And so to remain in Jesus is to practice rhythms of rest and stillness and quiet. And instead of the hustle and grind of the world around us, Because some of us need to hear the words of Jesus, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. We need rest. We are living our lives with no days off, and it's unsustainable, and it's exhausting us. Some of us need to write ourselves a permission note to take some time to rest, to be still. Some of us need to trust that we have enough instead of always wanting more. Some of us need to take some naps. Some of us need to take at least some days off. Now, there may be those of us who say, okay, Eric, I I actually, I do trust that Jesus, I trust him when he says that there is enough and that I am enough. And my work-life balance is pretty good, and I'm 
taking some time for rest, and I'm, I'm practicing stillness and quiet. I, I'm doing these things, and that's great. And for you and for me, Jesus has a word for us. If we go further in this idea of the vine and branches, Jesus goes further in John 15, and he says, As the Father has loved me, so I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. When Jesus invites us to remain, he's he's calling us to something that's far more revolutionary than just taking a few days off and resting. We remain in the love of Jesus by keeping his commands. And what are the commands of Jesus? What is the command he says here? To love each other as Jesus has loved us. As you and I have been liberated by the love of Jesus, Jesus says then we must turn around and then liberate others from the slavery of fear by loving them and showing them that they have enough and by making sure that they have enough and by letting them know that they are enough, that they are valuable in the way that we love them. Because perfect love, the Bible tells us, casts out fear. The only way to liberate people from fear, to liberate ourselves from fear, is to experience the love of Jesus, and then we, in turn, take that love and we share it with others to set them free from the fear of not having enough and not being enough. And so, to remain in Jesus is not just to be still. To remain in Jesus is to love each other by practicing radical generosity, by giving of what we have with others to share with them so that they will have enough even if that generosity costs us our comfort. To remain in Jesus is to love each other by using whatever privilege we may have to stand up and speak out for those in our society who are undervalued and overlooked. I think in particular today of those in the disability community, our disabled brothers and sisters, who are... who. Their very existence speaks out against our cultural mindset that your value comes from what you produce and what you do because their value is clear even if they are unable to produce and contribute in the ways that our society deems as valuable. To remain in Jesus is to love each other by doing the hard work as a church of making this a safer space for people who have been victims to tell their stories. And that their freedom to tell their stories and to be heard in a safe way is good, even if that comes at the cost of our success as a church or our reputation. This is what it means to remain, to love each other, because a great test of how free from fear we are is how much we're willing to give up to love others well. I'll say that again. A great test of how free from fear we are is how much we're willing to give up to love others well. Because if we're holding on to it tightly, then we're still in the grip of fear. But When we're liberated by love, we will let it go, and we will not hold on to anything. We will follow the example of Jesus, who was willing to give up his life out of love for others. And he invites us to do the same, to love others as he has loved us. So to live a life free of fear is to live a life where you are willing to give up everything in order to help others know that they will have enough, because you're going to care for them, and that they are enough because you love them and God loves them. And so as the team comes, I just want us to think about how, just in the same way that Moses liberated the Israelites from Egypt, Jesus comes to liberate us 
from the voice of fear that says there is not enough and that you are not enough. And instead, Jesus invites us to trust in these promises that we will have enough and that we are enough. And then to, in turn, as we receive that love and we are liberated, to then go and share that love with others, to, to make sure that they have enough and to, to allow them to know that they are enough. And so we started this talk this morning with a mantra of no days off. No days off. And instead, I want to give you a new mantra. And I would invite you to, to say this during the week, but we're just going to close our time by praying this together. And this new mantra is simply, in Jesus, there is enough. In Jesus, I am enough. And so I invite you to put your palms open and invite you to say with me, in Jesus, there is enough. And put your hands to your chest and say, In Jesus, I am enough. In Jesus, there is enough. In Jesus, I am enough. In Jesus, there is enough. In Jesus, I am enough. In Jesus, there is enough. In Jesus, I am enough. Amen.
Holy Spirit, help us to live a life free of fear. And when we seem to forget, remind us that we are children of God and show us how to love well this week. Family, there is no scarcity in the kingdom of God. And let's come together this week in our home churches and unpack that further. If you want more information about home churches, visit themeetinghouse.com slash home church. Okay, before we go, do you remember the mantra Eric shared with us? Can you say it with me? Let's put our hands out and remember, in Jesus, there is enough. Put your hands to your heart. In Jesus, I am enough. Go in peace.